Hey everyone, good to have you back. Today we're going to talk about Snell's Law and Refraction. Um, so first we're going to start by looking at this question, how does light behave when it bends? So we call that refraction, and that's just the bending of light when it goes from one material into another. So that's the type of thing you see when uh, things look distorted, if you see them underwater or through glass or through a fish tank or things like that. Uh, to understand that, we got to understand this idea of index of refraction. So we use the symbol lowercase n for that. And um, the key is light travels at different speeds when going through different substances. So the speed of light, that number you might be used to, 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, is the speed of light in a vacuum. And it's pretty close to the speed of light in air as well. But when light is going through other substances, here's some examples over here, it's going to slow down. So light is never going to go faster than that 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. But depending what it's going through, it might go slower. Here's the equation to show you how that works. This equation is on the equation sheet. Make sure you know where to find it. N is the index of refraction. C is the speed of light in a vacuum, which is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. You'll probably remember that, but if you ever forget it, it's in the constants section of the equation sheet. And then V is the speed of light in the material you're looking at. So notice if you are ever asked for the speed of light in the material or you want to know what the speed of light in the material is um, or that's what you're given, you might want to rearrange this equation if it's N equals C over V. If you solve that for V, that will give you V equals C over N. Um, kind of useful. This is maybe more practically how you'll be using it, even though this is how it's given. This is the definition of index of refraction. So if index is always greater than or equal to 1, you can see here, um, like if we have air, index of, of refraction is 1. Um, for our purposes, it's technically a tiny, tiny, tiny bit higher than 1, but good enough, close enough to 1. So in air, light's pretty much going to be going at C, 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. And we're going to assume that it goes exactly 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. But uh, N always greater than or equal to 1 means that light can go slower than this 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, but it's never going to go faster. Um, yeah, so a bigger N corresponds with a lower speed of light. So if you look at this list, um, something with the highest index. Is diamond on here? Yeah, there you go. 2.42. That's a pretty high index of refraction. So of all these substances, light's going to go the slowest in diamond, fastest in air, and then blah, blah, blah in between. Another little fun fact down here is uh, N varies by wavelength of light, um, except in a vacuum. They all have the same N in a vacuum. But that's why you can see up here this chart of index of refraction is specific to a wavelength of 590 nanometers or 5.9 times 10 to the minus seventh meters. That's just a very specific color of light or a very specific wavelength. Different wavelengths have slightly different index of refraction, which is why you see the nice Pink Floyd, dark side of the moon, uh, prism splitting light. So if you have white light that contains all the colors of the light, or all the colors of the rainbow going into a prism and bending as it passes through and then you can see the rainbow of colors on the other side that's because all of the different wavelengths of light have slightly different index which means they're going to bend at a slightly different angle when they pass through the prism um, so that's just sort of like a little bonus thing in case you ever wondered why that happened Okay, so that's the index. Now that you know the index, we can mathematically describe what's going to happen when light goes from one material to another and bends. Notice it's only going to bend um, if it comes in at an angle. If it goes from one to another just straight, both angles are going to be zero. and It'll just continue going straight. But if light comes in at an angle, it's going to bend either towards the normal or the perpendicular or away. So here's the equation for Snell's law that mathematically describes what happens when light bends going from one medium to another. Um, and it is N1 sine theta 1 equals N2 sine theta 2. 
Um, pretty straightforward equation, uh, index of refraction one, index of refraction two. Pretty much the only thing that sometimes people will sometimes um, mess up with this is the fact that both angles are measured relative to the normal. Remember, normal is just another word for perpendicular. So this is substance one up here. This is substance two. The angles for this equation are relative to the perpendicular line. So theta one is measured up here. Theta two is measured down here. This equation also says that because these things have to be equal, if you go to a higher index of refraction, you're going to have a lower um, angle of refraction as it passes through. So the way that this problem is classically presented is the whole thing about spearing a fish. So this is you, you're cast away on a desert island, you still got a smile on your face, you're happy to be here, and you see this uh, star face shaped fish, maybe it's like a sea anemone or something, I don't know. I don't know why I picked a star for that. Anyway, uh, you only have one spear and you want to know where to aim to try and hit it. You know that the, the fish is somewhere along this line, but you remember that things kind of look funny underwater. They look distorted. They don't always appear to be exactly where they are. Um, so you want to try to figure out where to aim so you can hit it with your spear um, so you can get it and have your sea anemone enemy or whatever the heck it is for dinner and keep on smiling. So you are starting in the air, throwing into water. Water have, has an index of refraction of about 1.33. And the important thing to remember here is light bends when it goes from one substance to another. It's going to refract, but your spear is not going to refract. Your spear is just going to go straight. So you want to figure out where the light is. First thing is which way is the light going? Lots of people, the first time they do these, draw like arrows coming from your eye to see where you're going to look. That's not how light works. You don't shoot laser beams out of your eyes. There's all this light coming from the sun. Some of the rays of light from the sun hit the fish and then bounce off the fish and then return to your eye. So when you draw your, your light rays, you want to show them starting at the object pointing towards your eye. Next, we got to figure out which way they're going to bend relative to the normal or this perpendicular line here. So we're going to have, so this is air, n equals 1 outside water, n equals 1.33. So our light coming from the fish is going to go from a higher to a lower index of refraction. So let's just show a ray of light coming out of the water here. We'll call this theta 1. We have to figure out how theta 2 compares to theta 1. Um, so we have 1 times the sine of theta 2 equals 1.33 times the sine of theta 1. Um, so here's our theta 2 over here relative to the normal. If our index of refraction goes down when we go from material 1 to material 2, that means theta 2 has to go up. So our index went down. So sine theta has to increase to keep it equal, which means that theta has to increase to keep it equal, which means theta 2 is going to be bigger than theta 1. So I'll show that like this. So you can see that this angle is a lot bigger than the angle that we started with here. So back to the situation. That means the light that goes to our eye is going to leave from the water. It's going to bend away from the normal and then reach our eye. So that might look something like this. So here we go. Light hits the water. There's a theta 1. Our theta 2 has to be bigger. So then it's going to bend away from that before it reaches our eye. So you can see, let's throw some arrows. So we show the directionality of that light. Theta 1. Theta 2 is bigger than theta 1 because the index decreases. And then the last thing is, what does this look like to us? Basically, our brains are used to seeing light travel in straight lines. So our brain thinks that this light traveled in a straight line. It doesn't take into account the fact that it refracted from the water into the air. 
So we're going to assume, our brains are going to assume, that it just went in a straight line path. So we, what our brains are kind of doing is taking this line and then extending it as if it were straight. So we think the fish is actually here because we think that it came in a straight line. So that means that we actually have to aim lower than where we actually see the fish. So take the angle that you see, aim below it, and you'll actually hit it with the, sp the sphere, the spear. There you go. All right, next we're going to look at something called total internal reflection. And before we talk about the numbers, I want to show you what this actually looks like. So we've got a light source. It is going into a prism. And then we're going to measure it coming out of the prism on the other side. So it's a Snell's law problem. We have an angle of incidence over here, theta 1, angle of refraction, theta 2. We're going to see how those change as we vary the angle of the light here. So we are increasing theta 1 down here. And as theta 1 increases, theta 2 increases. We'll pause it right there. Take a look at this. So you can see here, theta 2 is clearly bigger than theta 1, which should make sense because we're going from high index to low index. If n decreases, theta has to increase. So if we keep going, increasing our angle here, going from high to low, everything's well and good. Enjoying this just as much as you are. Couple fun things we have going on here. So one, you can see a nice little rainbow of colors. That's what I mentioned on the other side of the notes, the angle of refraction. So the angle that it's, or the index of refraction, sorry, the index of refraction um, is going to be slightly different for the different wavelengths of light. So this is why prisms and raindrops split that white light that has all the wavelengths together into multiple colors because here you can see the differences. The red is getting refracted the least and the purple is getting refracted the most. So that's kind of cool. Also, you can see this light here. What the heck is up with that? Well, that is reflection. So this surface of the prism on the top side here is reflecting a little bit of the light. So some of it is reflecting, some of it is refracting. The interesting thing I want to think about is what's going to happen if we keep increasing this angle? Because we're only at like 40 degrees or so for theta 1. If we keep pushing theta 1 bigger and bigger and bigger, what's going to happen over here? Because eventually our index of refraction or our, uh, or our angle of refraction, our theta 2, is going to hit 90 degrees. What's going to happen after that? There it is. And keep increasing it after there. And at this point, we don't see any refraction at all. We only see the bouncing one. That's reflection. So this is called total internal reflection. And it's what happens when you reach that angle that's called the critical angle. Critical angle is the situation where your um, theta 2 is equal to 90 degrees. And if you go to any angle where your theta 2 would be bigger than that or any angle beyond the theta 1 that caused theta 2 to equal 90, anything beyond the critical angle, all of the light is reflected. None of it comes out of the other side. Um, and it's called total internal reflection. And this is just a straight example of reflection. So theta 1 equals theta 2 inside here. Those angles are just mirror images of each other because the surface of the prism is acting as a mirror. Splendid. Okay, back to the notes here. So this is a picture of fiber optic cable. Um, that's probably the biggest example of a use of total internal reflection. 
Um, if you have fiber optic cable, cable, you can send a signal using light because if you have total internal reflection, none of the light is going to bounce out of the sides of the material and all of it's going to stay inside and bounce back and forth boing, 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 as it goes down the cable, which means if you don't lose any light, um, you don't lose hopefully any or you lose very little of your signal or your intensity that you started with. So you can send messages over long distances at the speed of light in the cable, which is going to be a little slower than the speed of light in the vacuum, but still pretty dang fast. So the key thing is that doesn't always happen when you shine light into a, a material like glass or water or fiber optic cable. You have to be beyond this critical angle, which we'll use theta sub C. Um, and the critical angle is defined as the angle at which the angle of refraction is 90 degrees. So you can see if we start with our light source aimed directly um, at the boundary between the two materials, just goes straight. For these angles over here, if you imagine the normal line for each of these cases, you can see that theta two is greater than theta one. Critical angle would be somewhere between these two angles here. Critical angle is when theta two equals 90. So if you hit your critical angle, all the light would be refracted directly along the surface. But the key thing is um, for angles bigger than the, the critical angle, all the light is reflected. None of it is refracted and passed pass through the other side. So that's something that you're going to have to know how to calculate. Good news is it's really easy to calculate that. So just start with a Snell's law problem. N1 sine theta 1 equals N2 sine theta 2. Critical angle is going to be an angle of incidence. So our angle for inside the material. So let's change that to N2 sine theta C is equal to N2 sine of theta 2. We're going to define the critical angle so that theta 2 equals 90. So go ahead and substitute this in for 90 degrees. Sine of 90 degrees is 1. So all that is equal to 1, which means N2 sine theta C. Oh, sorry, that should be an N1. My bad. N1 sine theta C equals N2. So then solving for the critical angle, if we have sine theta C equals N2 over N1, that means the critical angle is equal to inverse sine N2 divided by N1. So that's your angle, critical angle here, beyond which you have total internal reflection. So something important that you'll see from this, if you know anything about the inverse sine function, you can't put any value into that function that has a value greater than one because sine is never gonna be greater than one. So that means N2 divided by N1 cannot be bigger than one, which implies that to get a critical angle, to get total internal reflection, N1 has to be greater than N2, otherwise it's not possible. And that's why, think of fiber optic cable, you start in the cable, the cable is immersed in air usually, you always have to have a greater index that you're reflecting within, you can't do it if it's flipped. The last thing that I haven't really addressed, which is this last section of the notes here, I'm not going to go into too much detail today um, in this video, but if you want to know more about any of this, I would be happy, happy, happy to chat with you. But basically, that is the question of why. So we can measure that light bends when it goes from one material to another. Uh, you can see that with just shooting a laser beam and going from air into a uh, prism or from the prism back into the air, we can measure that light bends. And we can see that happen when things look distorted underwater or through a magnifying glass or through eyeglasses. 
but it's a lot harder to answer why that happens. There are a couple different explanations I have on here. One is the least time principle, which says that light's gonna take the path that requires the least time to get from A to B. And if you're going between different mediums, the path that goes, um, that takes the least time is not always a straight line. Confusing, mm, yeah. I can show you some examples of why the path may not be a straight line. The other explanation has to deal with uh, changing speeds, and there's actually a good way to, um, to explain that using a marching band as an analogy, which again, um, you, you maybe don't need to know the theoretical side as much and, and able to order to answer the mathematical problems, but I think some of that is really fascinating as to why this stuff actually happens. So if you wanna know more about why those happen or you're in the marching band yourself and you wanna know how your marching band will actually explain the refraction of light, might make you think differently about marching band and or light, you can either chat with me, I'd be happy to talk to you about those, or I put a top secret folder into the folder for this week that has tons of videos. Um, also one of the videos in there, you can have total internal reflection inside a liquid. What? Super cool. So there's some great stuff there if you want to know more. And please ask me if you have any questions.